everybody, and welcome to this podcast with the Grizzles. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed that musical intro from the 80s as much as I did. Um, it warmed my heart, it touched my soul, and I'm so thankful that we were allowed <laughs> to have that on this podcast. If you are here, man, we are thankful that you're here joining us. If you're um, here and you think somebody could be blessed by this podcast, send it out, let people know about it. Sorry it's only audio today, but desperate times call for desperate measures sometimes. So anything you'd like to say, my dear? Hey, everybody. We're so glad you're here. In case you haven't noticed, we are back and we're putting out new content weekly. So if you have something you'd like for us to talk about, why don't you uh, text the word THINK to 910-600-0498. And let us know what you'd like for us to talk about on this podcast, The Grizzles on the Biblos Network. That's right. So we're going through a little bit of a rebrand, trying to get everything concise and under the same thing. And so you can find us on Instagram at the underscore grizzles now. Um, You can also find us online at thegrizzles.org. Yeah. G-R-I-Z-Z-L-E-S dot org. Thegrizzles.org. So today we're going to jump into a... um, a subject that is uh, pretty interesting. I think it's pretty interesting anyway. And it's um, one that is kind of at our church right now. We're teaching a series. Let's give the full backstory. And the series is titled The Measure of Man. And we're talking about um, the just as kind of Paul's scripture or Paul's writing in Corinthians where he says, it's unwise to measure ourselves among ourselves. So yes. how do we measure ourselves? Well, we measure ourselves through the word of God. And this past week, um, we, we began the series. This is February 2023. Um, and so we started talking about something that all people deal with. And we yes. want to cover it on the podcast today. If you'd like to see the sermon in its entirety, you can go to um, atwilmington.com. Or AT, is that what it is? atwilmington.com. I don't know why I was so confused for it. Yeah, it's atwilmington.com. Yep, and you can find our sermons there. You can find it on the Converse on your podcasts, or you know, you'll probably get the gist of it during this today. But we are going to talk about anger. This is really a great topic um, yeah. because I, this is something that everyone experiences, but also um, sometimes anger gets a bad connotation. And it's not necessarily a bad connotation. It's okay to be angry, but we're more talking about how you display your anger, what is healthy, what is not. Because um, like you said, this is something everyone experiences. And what we're seeing a lot today in our world is that um, the devil perverts a lot of things. And so um, sometimes we're angry and we should be angry. Um, I know that probably, honey, you're going to talk about maybe instances in the Bible where anger was displayed and it was a holy anger. But but now in our society, we're seeing anger displayed and it is very dysfunctional. And so what we want to talk about today is maybe talk about the biblical context of anger, but also the practical application of you know, when I am angry, what is a healthy way for me to express my anger? What's a healthy, healthy, excuse me, coping mechanism that I can show that I'm angry, but not revert to um, the base worldly kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lower level than what God has hmm. designed for yeah. us to live yeah. as Christians, as human beings. Yeah. You know, um, Ephesians 4, 26 says that Paul writing to the church of Ephesus says, be ye angry and yeah. sin not. Yeah. So he is ge- delivering us to the, the message that you can be angry, but you don't have to allow your anger to push you into sin. That's and right. so I think that the, the, exactly what my wife just said is that we have to find a way to exhibit anger that doesn't include us sinning. What does that look like? Um, now, we're going to talk about the spiritual side of anger and the practical side of anger because some would say that anger is the result of the fall of humanity. 
Um, others say that it is a result of divine design, that it was mm-hmm. innate within us. Interesting. Um, uh, my argument is this, is that I'm trying to find the scriptural references. In several portions of scripture, it it is it said that God exhibited anger. Yeah. Um, and for the life of me, I can't. Oh, here it is. In Exodus 4, Judges 2, um, in Mark 3, Jesus exhibited anger. In Matthew 21, he displayed anger in driving money changers out of the temple. Um, my argument is this, is that God was not subject to the fall as humanity was. Right. And therefore, it leads me to believe that anger was designed to be exhibited by the creation because it is within the creator. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, that does not mean that in the garden the result or demonstration of anger was present, right, pre-fall, but it, it, it means that within every individual lies that ability to become angry because God himself yeah. has the ability to become well, angry. Well, and it's kind of like um, what we just said in Scripture. Um, you know, God says, I am a jealous God, right? Yeah. And we see jealousy yeah. portrayed here on earth, but it is perverted into where it can be yeah. sinful. Yeah, and, and, and I guess the way that, that we would... Pr- we probably should put that as God is angry. Most oftentimes God is shows his anger. Um, like with, with Moses, he showed it in Exodus four when, when, when Moses was saying, I can't do what you're telling me to do. Um, he exhibited with the Israel's, I believe it was in Joshua or wherever I said it was. And he, he was angry with the Israelites because they left him. Yeah. Um, Jesus was angry with the Pharisees because they were trying to uh, catch him not following their law. Yeah. He was angry with the money changers because they perverted the use of the temple. So what you'll find is, is that his anger would be what we call righteous indignation. Yeah. And that is different from humanistic anger that right. is exhibited upon each other. Right. Um, if that makes sense. And so we, we know we're going to feel it. And so what does it look like when we feel it? And, and how do we approach it? Because the, the, the nuance with anger is that anger is what they call, and, and my wife can allude more to this, is what they call an umbrella emotion. Yeah. And it's something people exhibit when there is something else that is the root cause that is causing them stress. If they're stressed, they become angry. If they are embarrassed, they become angry. Yeah. Um, and so when, when we see that, that umbrella emotion, sometimes, you know, anger isn't the root of what's going on. Yeah. But with some people, it is. Some people are angry. Maybe they're angry because of trauma or... So anger is something that we feel, yeah, but it's not something we have to be subject to. Right. That's right. Well, and to you on a side note, and I'm not trying to uh, go off into maybe another podcast. I think we have to be, because I think this podcast is talking to, um, it's talking to everyone, but um, I know that a lot of ministers and evangelists say that they listen to this podcast. I think we have to be really <clears throat> careful too with our anger um, because sometimes we will label our anger as divine. Oh boy. Or that we're being holy oh boy. in our anger. And really it's just us rising up in our flesh. Yeah. Maybe in a spiritual setting. So we <laughs> feel like oh, this is, you know, holy, righteous anger. But I'll ask you if it's really a spiritual anger, um, are you lashing out at your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you tearing people down? Are you um, sinning, doing things that are against God's word, and then yeah. putting it under the umbrella of the spiritual, of the divine? And I think that's where we're at with this podcast today. Not that specifically. Well, let's but just stay just, there for a minute. But just when anger goes off the rails, and sometimes yeah. we put it under a holy connotation, it and comes, it's not. It, it steps behind the pulpit and comes out in a sermon. Yeah. You know, so here's the deal is that I, I want to say this. So um, in Titus chapter one, verse seven, Paul gives the um, he gives the qualifications for a bishop. A bishop today is what we would call a 
pastor, a pastor as we know it, it's not our yeah. connotation of bishop. Um, from my understanding of scripture, uh, if there is if there is another understanding out there, I'm well open to it. But he he lists all of these things, you know, not a drunkard, you know, all these things, and those are easy ones, you know. Yeah, husband of one wife, don't have multiple wives, y'all. Some would say that refers. Oh some will say that refers to divorce. I think it probably refers to monogamy more than it okay. refers to. I was like, oh no, we just yeah. went into a whole other. <laughs> We're gonna stop there, but it okay. says then it says not soon angry. Yeah. Okay. Now I want to say that I said this in my sermon the other night, and I'm going to say this very clearly that um, what the subject we're getting ready to get into, do not skip to the rest of this podcast without listening to this disclaimer, (laughs) okay? You need to hear this, that people in the world, some people throughout our world in general, have been subject to spiritual abuse, right? Um, they, They have been abused spiritually, However, some people who claim spiritual abuse have not been spiritually abused, but they use that hot button phrase as a way to disregard spiritual authority. Yeah. Um, now, so I want to make that very clear. I, I, I don't want to say that no one's been spiritually abused because my wife and I's exposure to the larger apostolic conglomerate as a whole says very much otherwise. However, if we're not careful, it will, will be, it will be a topic that we will allow for people that are not very spiritual just to flippantly do what they would like. Um, But on the flip side of that, we're talking about anger. If you display anger, you are quick to be angry, you are flipping tables, you are tearing up your wife's clothes, you're throwing your cell phone, you're you're going off on people at work. You just disqualified yourself. Oh boy. From minis- per Paul, not Evan Grizzle. Oh boy. Per Paul, not soon angry was the qualification of a bishop. Um so we have to be careful because let, let me give you the flip the double side to this is that in ministry there will be people that will hurt you. Yeah. We talk about That's spiritual true. abuse, but there is there are people that seek to harm the ministry. That's true. So there's two there's a double side here. That's right. Like people that um are in it for themselves, so they'll do selfish things, maybe they'll take advantage of goodwill of a minister and so they'll they'll do them wrong. Or I've seen people that have been in a bad situation yeah. with a pastor or minister, so mm-hmm. then you know, they feel like everyone's the same. So then they're after all ministry. Yeah, it's a that's, yes. That's sad. And so ministers can be hurt too. Don't think ministers are not above that. There's there's time like Paul and Demas. Demas left Paul and he went to, um, oh man, most believe that he went to Nicolaitia, I believe, right? Yeah. No, Thessalonica, Thessalonica. That's what it was, that and was. and and okay. got into the the Nicolaitan church, is what okay. what some historians believe. Either way, most historians would agree that he went to Thessalonica. There is one writing from an early apostolic church father that says that Demas became a a priest in false doctrine. I heard that. Yeah. maybe it was from you. It was from me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but what? Here's what he said though. Yeah. Here's what is Paul said. Demas has forsaken me. Yeah. He left the truth, but Paul took it personally. So there's hurt on the side of pastors. Oh, yeah. But pastors can also hurt people. Yeah. So there's a double-sided coin there, right? Yeah. And And so uh, we have to be mindful of that whenever we talk about anger. And and listen, myself, Pastor Urshan, and my wife are going to sit down, and we are going to do the very best we can as much as, as that topic will allow us to to give a working definition to spiritual abuse. Yeah. Now, that subject is very nuanced and it is not a one size fits all, but if we can give principles for spiritual abuse, then we can apply it's kind of like narcissism. You give principles for narcissism and you apply it to an individual. We give or you you apply it to a situation. So right. so we say, here's the principles of spiritual abuse. Does this apply in this situation? That's right. So we're going to try to do that. So, but but just for now, we should say that ministers should not be soon angry. If a minister has been hurt, they can become a very jaded 
yeah. and very cynical. cynical. And when cynicism creeps in, then it, 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 it makes you less guarded with negative emotion toward others. That's right. Does that make sense? It does. So like if my wife has done me wrong, mm. then all women could do me wrong. So if I see a woman coming up and talking to me, then I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, oh, that, that, that person probably has... Ill will towards exactly, me. Yeah. and it and it makes us we we are tend uh, we we tend to be less guarded with our negative emotion than we are with our positive when we're yeah. cynical because we, we this, this is what cynicism will do <laughs> with cynicism you will quickly believe negative information about others but you're slow to believe positive information about others yeah so that shows you that we're we're far less guarded with negative information yeah and so we have to be careful on the side of ministry that we don't allow people. Pat casting your pearls before the swine. You can't allow the piggies to make you cynical toward the sheep. Yeah. You just can't do it. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. You're going to be hurt. Right. You're like, well, you're a young pastor. You don't know. I've been around church a very long time. Yeah. I've seen mentors, elders, friends, family members hurt in the church. Yeah. I've seen people become cynical within the church. We have to remember why we're doing ministry, and it's not... It's not necessarily for people. It's because of the call of God. So let me ask you something. Then. Ooh, I'm getting a question again? Yeah. That's just how these, this is how these podcasts are turning. So what do you think is a healthy way to process anger? If you're dealing with a church, say a church situation pops up and mm-hmm. it makes you really angry. From what perspective? Um. Well, a you're saint a saint or a pastor. You're a pastor. So how could you respond to a situation yeah. that um, makes you really angry? Yeah. What's a healthy way? What's a godly way to respond? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the first thing you do is you never act when you're angry. Yeah. You stop. Yeah. If you're angry, you step away. Yeah. Um, you pray. You think about it. Um, most, most things are not as expedient as we make them out to be. Right. And so if we can keep ourselves from acting in anger or while we feel that emotion, anger blocks logic for some reason. If we can keep that emotion from overcoming our logic yeah. and even our spiritual side. A lot of times because like when we're angry, our body goes into a stress state. Fight or flight. Fight, fight or, or fight. Yeah. Fight or flight. And so when your body is in survival mode, then the, I've actually did some like psychoeducation on this. When your body is in fight or flight mode, then the most logical parts of your brain are not active. They're not at the forefront. Um, so maybe one step, another step is, well, first, like you said, you don't have to react immediately. Yeah. But the second thing, Maybe a second thing, and you can tell me what you think about this, is to think to yourself, okay, what's what's really going on here? It's the steps of anger management. Okay. Right? Okay. What what about this is making me mad? Yeah. Did we talk about that last podcast? Did we say something about <sighs> anger management? We yeah. have a thread of conversation, folks. This yeah. is what's... I can't remember if it's the last one or the one before. I think but, it might have been the last one. Yeah. yeah. So, but like, what's really what's really going on here? Yeah. And that's using that emotional intelligence that we talked about last time. Like, what's really going on here? Yeah. Um, do I, Here's a really important... Here's a really important question to ask yourself. Do I have all the information oh I need yeah. to know that this is the proper emotion right now? Yeah, because you're, you're you have to ask yourself. People, I think Carrie Newhoff said this. People judge others by their actions, while they judge themselves by their intentions. Is are people's intentions what we think they are? Right, because I think that's a lot of times that's a reason why we get angry is because we will maybe misunderstand someone's intention or we'll hear something right. that someone may have said and we're swift to make a judgment call, yeah. mm-hmm. which I, I mean, we all totally understand that. Everybody's That's, been there. Yeah. And so I think part mm. of managing that anger is saying, okay, do I have all the information? Right. Um, and, and, and am I acting in a proper response? Um, what do I need to know that I don't know right now? Right. 
and and I think something that we're missing a lot, um, maybe in the world, maybe in the apostolic movement, I don't know, but we're missing a lot of um, direct communication. <laughs> Yeah, you know, with the person that like made us angry, like we feel like if we said something mm-hmm. to them in passing, then they should just know. But instead of like if you've been offended or if you've been hurt, you know, going to someone and saying, "Hey, now look, I get there's situations where that may not be possible, but it seems like we're missing a lot of mm-hmm. that yeah. um, in our world today." <laughs> I just thought about it. It says if your hand, if your arm offends you, cut it off. Not if your brother. <laughs> you know, and, and we want to cut off our brother like we would an appendage um, yeah. when, when it offends us. I yeah. don't think that's why the Bible says uh, the Bible gives cancel, clear in, cancel cultures in yeah, the church now. It is. So the Bible gives us clear instruction of how to handle a dispute. Yeah. Go to them. Go to them. If they don't yeah. receive it, go with a couple more. Yeah. If they don't receive it, then you go to the church elders. Yeah. It's a three strike you're out rule. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of the time. Many, many things can be cleared up with discussion. Whoever said that confrontation is a bad thing lied. And yeah. I, I used to be terrible with confrontation. Yeah. But what I've found is that if you really, if people know you love them, confrontation is not easy, but it's tolerable. You can confront things that need to be, like if you have been hurt, Yeah. you need to be able to, Confront it. Now, if that person don't receive it, that's up to them. Yeah. But if you if you have been, if you're angered over something, as my wife said, take time. As I said, think about it. Don't be angry when you act on it. You know, and, and, and but then confront it. Be okay with talking about it. Well, I dealt with a situation the other day that um, kind of made me upset when I was aware of the situation. But then I just reached out to the person and said, hey, you know, this is what I'm kind of perceiving. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. You know, and left the door open to um, yeah. what are they thinking? Like, what are their thought What's processes? What's on their mind? Instead of just assuming that we know what they're thinking. Because sometimes we're quick to rush into, well, I know they're thinking this, and I know just, they're yeah. doing this, and their intention must have been this and that. And That this. was my other thing I was going to say, and you just brought that back to my mind because I forgot about, like, what don't, like, I could, I was like, how do you handle anger? I could tell you how not to handle it. Internal dialogue. Yeah. Right? Because when we're mad, we want to talk to ourselves about it. Yeah. And so we'll, like, we work ourselves into a frenzy. When me, and, I was telling my wife this the other day when we first got married, when she would make me mad, I would talk myself through. I would let her have it in my head, like just letting her have <laughs> I it. I asked him if there's still anything you felt like you needed to tell me from those conversations. No, there's he not. He said no. He closed them out. Yeah, I worked out. <laughs> I worked it out. But but that's what it was, though. That was yeah. that was a default position of mine was the negative. you didn't like confrontation. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, and so I just I would just let you have it in my head. And, and, and the problem is it lengthens the amount of time you feel angry. Because you're still, that person may be over it, but you're still mad because you've talked about it 40 times since well, the last time you've seen them. Well, let me ask, let me just add, not ask, let me add to the direct communication with the person. Yeah. If you're angry and you're trying to directly communicate, then here's what, and I see this in um, marriage counseling all the time. If you're trying to directly communicate and you're doing it out of anger and you have this rant that you want to go on and you want this person to hear it but you're not willing to listen. Oh boy. See, that's the thing is sometimes we've already decided in our head what we're feeling, the other person's intentions and the outcome. So if the other person starts to explain, well, my intention was this, or this is what I was thinking, then we've already, we're so stubborn in our mind that we're like, no, it's not. I already know what you were trying to do. You were trying to blah, 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 blah. And you're this and you're that and you're blah, blah, blah. Isn't it amazing how maleficent we think people are? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's, yeah. And I think it points to more than just anger. There's a devil in that coffee maker. (laughs) I think more than just anger, I think that it can point to some other issues that we're dealing with in our spirits. Because if we, what it, what does the Bible say? Be swift to hear and slow to speak. Oh no. It says be swift to hear and slow to anger. So to anger, there we go. <laughs> yeah, let me find it. It's in my notes. Yeah, go ahead, keep on talking. Yeah, but like we're ninety nine percent sure won't it's what even it said. we won't even like listen because we've already determined 
everything. We're the judge, the jury, we're the lawyers, and yep. it's all, you know, what we think it is, and we won't even give the other oh, person a yeah. chance. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, yep. well, so that, to that's right. So it was yep. both. Yeah. So, and I think the other thing to consider, too, with this is ask yourself, what are you feeling? Because my, my husband mentioned that anger is an umbrella emotion. What are you feeling under that anger? Do you feel rejection? Do you feel shame? Um, do you feel embarrassed? Like, what is it that you're feeling that is driving you to this anger? Yeah. Are you worried about what other people are thinking? I've seen that a lot. People become really angry because of a situation, and it all stems back to a deep insecurity. They're worried about what other people may be assuming about the situation. Yeah. And in my experience, people are rarely talking as much as we think they are. Yeah, yeah. Usually, you know, you someone catches your eye, and they're whispering in someone's ear, and you're like, oh, they were talking about me. Like, yeah. it's usually very rare as that, that's the case. Yeah. You know, and, and two, you know, from a practical aspect, you need an outlet. Um, an outlet, a safe outlet, a, a godly outlet. So is that talking to someone? Is that talking to a counselor? Is that talking to a pastor or a friend? Um, is that talking to a mentor? Is that talking to a peer? Um, is that going golfing? You know, is that playing a video game? What is that outlet that you need that is godly that will allow you to, to process the anger? Because maybe it's working out or lifting weights or... You know what's interesting? I just thought of this. You can tell me what you think. It might be a stupid way of thinking. But, like, when you said outlet, like, I thought of a power outlet, okay? You're putting something in, but that power outlet is putting putting that it's putting out power back into whatever you've plugged in so t sometimes we want an outlet but we don't want any feedback we don't want anything if i had an organ right now you know what i'm saying yeah. like we just want to go to a friend and unload. just like unload what do you call that um, dumping, emotional yeah. dumping. Yeah. But like then they try to <laughs> Some put... Some people are emotional landfills. But then they try to put something back into us. Maybe some logic, maybe yeah, some feedback. prayers, maybe some spiritual guidance. Well, yeah, because I have a friend... Go ahead. And we won't receive it. Yeah. Like I have a friend last week, we had an issue come up and I had a friend I called. It's a good friend that I talked to. And they're so full of the stinking Holy Ghost. Yeah. And they're so um, full of, the, like, they their fruit is on full, full display. The fruit of Galatians 5 is on full display in their life. Oh, and it makes me so mad. Because I'm like, how in the <laughs> world? <laughs> you know, well, I'll tell you honestly what it does. It convicts me. Yeah. It's because I'm like, okay, they're spiritually mature. Well, and, I need to be in that moment. And thank God yeah. for those kind of friends. Because sometimes They didn't even have to say anything. Some, it's just their reaction to sometimes stuff. Sometimes people think that to be friends with someone to, in order for friendship to work, that you have to agree all the time. You yeah. have to view every situation the that's same. Yes, man. Yeah, but that's right. And the accountability, sometimes people seek accountability in others, but they have no accountability in themselves. Well, think about David. Um, I don't know why I thought about this, but think about David whenever he wanted to number the people. He yeah. knew he wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah. And the person he told, I can't remember the person's name that he told him, he, the person pushed back. Yeah. I don't think I don't know if we should do that. Yeah. David decided to do it anyway. Yeah. But even the the great Israel still to this day causes him the greatest king to ever live had people in his life that would push back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Saul didn't. Yeah. And you notice it. Saul did not have people that would push back. Samuel said, "Go kill everything." Yeah. The, is it Amalekites? Yeah. They said, "Go kill everything in the Amalekites," and so. They didn't do it. There was nobody pushing back against Saul, but there's someone, David was with people that would push back against him. But when the man of God came to Saul and said, why? Yeah. And he was angry. Mad. And Saul just. Anger. Rebellious. Yeah. I think we talked about originally on our narcissistic podcast that yeah. Saul was extremely narcissistic. Yeah. He yeah. was he was king in his head. Yeah. David was king in his heart. And, and so... So we, um, but the, it, anger, anger extends other places too. parenting. Yeah. Let's talk right? about it. Ephesians six and four. And do you fathers, let's make this gender neutral and you fathers and mothers provoke not your children to wrath or anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Um, this is a, this is something I'm going to say on this podcast. This is not the views of anyone related to this podcast. This is strictly the view. It's not, I don't even know if it's the view of my wife. But it is the view of Evan Grizzle. We gotta find out. If you if you 
if you hit your children, spanking or otherwise, in anger, I believe you're sinning. Yeah. Now, I am a pro spanker for your children, right? I I do think you need to reprimand. Um, If it's... If it's used appropriate. A, as, yeah, appropriate. if it's an effective tool. Mm-hmm. We um, have one daughter that it's not effective on. Yeah. And we have one daughter, if you raise your voice, she will cry like a just like she is, a little girl. I'll, <laughs> honestly, I feel like in our experience that um, we are willing to spank our children, but yeah. I feel like we found have found other forms well, of discipline that work better than spanking. For but us. I, yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm just saying that. Yeah. Like we we sh- we should not parent our children out of anger. We should parent our children. So think about this. God is referred to many times in Scripture as the heavenly Father, and 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 Jesus said, "If your earthly father knows how to give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly Father?" Yeah. Imagine if the heavenly Father uh, reprimanded you when he was angry with you. I've seen parents. That basically abuse their children yeah. and call it godly parenting. Yeah. Well, and, and, and let me, we, we should give this disclaimer. We're not here to judge anybody, but we are here to look at what scripture says because we're talking about the measure of men. Yeah. Well, some will say, spare the rod, spoil the child is a license to beat your child. Which they say is scripture, but I don't think it is, is it? Beat your child? No, spare the rod, spoil the child. Don't they say he that I think that spareth the rod of correction? He that and is he that spareth the rod hateth his son. Yeah. 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 So they use that. Um, so it says it just not that way. Yeah. yeah. They yes, that's not the but they say that and use it as an excuse to beat their yeah. children death. When really, here's my license to give you a black eye. When really. Um, you're being reactionary as yes. parents. And, I, and look, nobody is perfect at this, okay? But something that we have tried to do as parents or we try to implement is that we try to already have a plan of discipline with our kids before the situation happens so that we're not responding out of anger. Yeah. We're not responding to our kids out of embarrassment. Our kids know... We try to have them know what to expect yeah. versus, okay, they do something one time and it's okay. <laughs> then they do something another time, but yep. because our friends are around or it's in front of other people yep. that That's we like flip out and spank them and, you know. Three strikes, all. you're out rule. If you do it again, you're getting a spanking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let them know. Yeah. Can't, you can't expect them to live up to expectations if they're not voiced up. Yeah. Voices, expectations. Yeah, and so then, you know, the kids are confused about what's okay and what's not. Yeah. And so having a plan, and I tell this with um, to parents of teenagers too, that you and your spouse and your teenager decide in advance. Like, put them in on the process. Like, if they break curfew, work up a punishment with them. What's the consequences for breaking curfew? What's the consequences for... Um, you know, breaking household rules in advance, make up a contract, yeah. have them sign it. You right. guys sign it as parents. That way, you know, when they come mm-hmm. down, um, they come in late at night one night and you're mad because it woke you up out of a sound sleep and you come down and like punch them in the face. Well, you know, like <laughs> the consequences well, <laughs> have already been. Let's dial that back a little bit. Yeah, Good right. Lord. I know. But like, <laughs> dude, you'd be surprised the stories I know. But like. <laughs> But, like, decide in advance what yeah. that's going to be. And that way you are not reacting out of anger. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing, right? Yeah. There's There's reactive. There's proactive. Yeah. And it's the same in marriage, too. Yeah. Like, when you have confrontation or you have disagreements yep. and you're angry at each other. That's what I do with my wife. I let her know this is getting ready to be your consequences. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he does. And uh, so... You get angry, yeah. so you punch a wall, or um, you start yelling and screaming, or you you know jump in your car and squeal tires going down the street. Okay, you know what? Is that the most appropriate response for your anger? You no. know, you and your spouse can disagree and still love each other. You can disagree with your children. Your children can disagree with you. Yep. I know that's shocking. They can disagree with you and Everyone still love each other, but it's making a plan to have a 
functioning disagreement with your spouse. See, that's where we're headed. That's yes. exactly where I wanted to go. Notice yes. the word function. Uh, 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 people tend to parent the way they were parented, whether they want to or not. Yeah. The problem with that is the way you were parented was, is not perfect. That's right. And I told my mom the other day, and you would have thought I ripped her toenails off. <laughs> like, I, I told her that I, I, our life was great, but it wasn't perfect because nobody is. <laughs> What do you mean? I, love I just mean our, as great as my parents are, right? There was our life was not perfect. Sure. Now, here is the beauty of everything in in Scripture. Now, as a pastor, you can speak on several levels of authority. You can speak from divine, like anointed authority, which is God speaking through you. You can speak from experience, experiential authority, or you can speak from scriptural authority. So when it comes to parenting, our children are five, three, and seven months. It's hard to speak from experiential authority. So we go to the Word of God. And what does the Word of God say about it? The beautiful thing about the Word of God is it will take your, if you take it and you superimpose, I mean, lay it on top of Scripture to measure your life, it can take dysfunction and make it function. Right. Because the, the Word of God is functional. Yeah, And so it's the same thing with parenting, with marriage, with uh, friendships, with pastoring, with whatever the case is, it is functional and you can operate there. Um, and so that, that's kind of what, that's kind of what we're trying to help here with is how do we make it functional? And not only is it spiritual information from the word of God, but it's also um, educational information and uh, professional experience um, information of, you know, what works with teenagers. For you. Correct. Right. Yes, what works with teenagers, what works with young people. <laughs> Not it. Um, Tell you that right now. Right, because, um, <laughs> you know, when you work with young people, you understand, yeah. well, first of all, their maturity levels. Um, you work with children, you understand <laughs> human, human development um, and how parts of the brain are maturing and how they're growing and like what stages um, in childhood development experience certain things. And then you can apply so scientific principles, but also biblical principles. And then you can use like when I'm talking to parents, I'm always like, you know, your child. Um, so you can take these scientific principles. Yeah. You can take these biblical principles and what you know about your child yeah. and make a really great decision about what you want to do. So that's like the Galatians 522 list, the fruit of the spirit. One of the fruit, one of the fruits is temperance, self-control. Yeah. So it, it, it marries very well with anger to be able to control oneself. When we, we were talking about levels of life for a minute, um, Brother Urshan preached on it. And with study, it's easy to find out that it's true. At the level of an organism, it has no brain. It does what is coded in its DNA to do because it has no thought. When you rise above that, you get to the animalistic, which has a brain, but is incredibly impulsive. You can have a pet tiger, but if that pet tiger gets hungry and your arm looks juicy that day, it can rip it off and eat you. Um, because it is given to animal behavior, animalistic behavior and impulse. The level above that is man, human. The ability to logically work through and overcome compulsory impulse, right? The problem with that is, a th- I can tell you with a three-year-old, their impulse control is negative 0.75. There's nothing there. And so whenever you get, whenever you are prone to ang- fits of anger and you give in to that impulse, you are literally lowering yourself to the level of a three-year-old or an animal. Well, sometimes we get mad at our kids because they stomp off to their room and slam the door or yeah. like they start yelling. They have no impulse control. We don't, Well, the other part of that is we don't realize that they're watching us, and that's what we do when oh we boy. get mad. Oh, boy. And so um, one of the things you were talking about, our three-year-old, well, if you escalate with her, yeah. she's going to escalate right back. But if she's having a hard time controlling herself, like because she doesn't have impulse control, then 
not always, you know, because I'm not a perfect parent. But my goal in those situations is to say, oh, okay, I see you're having a hard time carrying out what I've asked you to do. Right. I'm going to help you now <laughs> and help her do it because it's obvious she cannot get a hold of herself enough to, you know, and I think that's even a, an approach you can take with your your teenagers when they're feeling overwhelming emotions or your, your adolescent, when they're just, especially when they're going into those early adolescent years, they feel a lot of big emotions. It's almost like, going back into toddlerhood, except they can speak. Um, but it, they're feeling a lot of big emotions and, you know, approaching your children and not being angry at them for having emotions, but training them in a godly way of how they can manage their emotions saying, you know, I see you're feeling a lot of things right now. Um, how can I help you? Like, what can I do? Can, can we talk? Can we take a walk? Can we, you know, and that's even the same with your spouse. If you, they're going through a season of life and they're feeling a lot of things, you know, my husband has been like, you know, how can I be there for you? How can I help you? What can I do right now? I, it seems like you're feeling overwhelmed. Like what, what can I do to help you right now? And you know what? That's, That's a godly approach. It really is. And when you're feeling angry, even asking yourself, you know, what will help me right now? What am I really feeling? Who can I express this to? You know, what what can I do to help process this and understand? And, you know, asking the Lord to help you because he can. Um, Asking him to help you and, and control that anger and, yeah. and, you know, you can really see the fruit of the spirit <clears throat> displayed in your life. Your anger does not have to control you. Right. Yeah, that's so true. And and so how do we process it, you know, I think is, is important. So um, we've been going for a while. I'm good. Do you want to talk about its connection to holiness before we jump off? Yeah. Um, I, I would that men everywhere... Lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Um, the Greek for holy in this word is not what we under, normally understand. So when we hear holy in the New Testament, there's usually two forms. There is hagios, which is um, holy spirit, hagios pneuma. Um, it means most holy thing, pure, consecrated. But then this one is hosios, or um, holy hands, as he's speaking here. It's undefiled by sin, free from wickedness, uh, observing every moral obligation. And then it says, without wrath, the word means anger or temper. And then it says, or doubting, and the word is dialogismos, or where we get our word dialogue from. It literally means inward deliberation. Yeah. Now, this is what I believe the scripture is telling us there. You see, it's statistically proven that men and women experience anger the same amount. Right. The same amount. Yeah. Um, The difference occurs when... Uh, in what they do with the anger. Right. Um, And I misspoke the other night when I was preaching. So I said that women were more likely to pursue revenge. It's actually men. Interesting. Women are more likely to ruminate or stew on the anger, to think about it, to have that inward thought. I think God's telling us, though, or Paul in writing to Timothy, is saying Whenever you go to lift up your hands, let it be hands that don't that don't raise don't raise a hand to God that you've raised to others in anger. Mm. And when you come to worship me, don't worship me with a mind that is inwardly deliberating the anger that you have toward other people. That's good. Um cuz then it's per, it's a it's a perverse praise. It's not pure. Right. And so I think that is one of the connections to holiness. Yeah. Um, Romans, Paul wrote in Romans that we pursue righteousness unto holiness. Yeah. 
Some people say that holiness standards, outward dress is holiness. That's not holiness. Outward standards are righteousness unto holiness. That's right. That we work because holiness is not attainable by action. It is a pursuit with action. It's not attainable until you get to heaven. That's right. Um, because we're we're desperately wicked. Yes. And so we have to work righteousness too. Now I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about we do what we know is right That's and right. what scripture tells us to do, what the word of God, how will we know them? How will we you'll know that my disciples have loved one for another? Jesus said, also, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. That's righteousness. That's right. And so we work righteousness unto holiness with our hands, not lifting up hands to others in anger. Now, if you want to make me angry, there's there's three things you can do. Come after my kids, yeah. come after our church, yeah. or come after my wife. Yeah. Two of those threes is going to get you a punch. Oh my. Right in the eye socket. Okay. If you come after my kids, you come after my wife, I'm going to take you down. Okay. That is innate in man to be a protector that we honor the wife as the weaker vessel. Sure. Now some of you guys are being protected by your wife. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> that was a joke. Anyway. Oh, my word. <laughs> I'm going to stop. We're really digressing right We are. Now. But okay. I, I think anger is a part of God's plan. Yeah. It's the display of anger that is unholy at times. Yeah. You um, know, and I think that sometimes, um, you know, people will say, well, you shouldn't get angry for any reason. But I think that you um, touched on something right there. Like someone comes after your wife or your children yeah. and you're a man, like you're going to become You're going to beat the brakes off of them. You're, you're going, you're, you're going, going to find a bat. You're going to, oh my gosh, you're going to become angry. This coffee's kicking in. You know, and so we're not saying you can't be angry. We're yes. talking about yes. what does it look like to be angry, but yeah. handle it in a a way that God has intended yep. for his people. Exactly. And so that's what we that's what this podcast was for. You're welcome for the for the light entertainment there at the end. Um so hopefully this helps somebody. Um if you know somebody that deals with anger, send them this podcast and see how angry you can make them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um you know, we might turn this into a weekly thing cuz my wife is going to be talking next week. We might go through this series on here. Because next week we're going to be talking. What are we talking? What are you? T- my wife is teaching next week. Yeah, I figured you would just rip the audio and post it. Oh no, 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 no! We need to have a deeper dive into it because that's what we did today. What are you talking about? Remind me. Pettiness. Pettiness. Yeah, that's what we're talking. That's what she's preaching, teaching about next Wednesday night. So that would be tomorrow when this podcast comes out. So because um, we release on Tuesdays. So tomorrow night, seven p.m. Apostolic. ATWilmington.com slash live. You'll find us there. She'll be teaching um, tomorrow on pettiness. And at the end of this week, at the end of that week, we'll record it and come out with another podcast. So, honey, is there anything you want to say before we're dismissed in the fear of the Lord? I think I'm good. Don't Thank forget you. to share this with your friends. Don't forget to tell everybody about it. Truly, we're so thankful that you took the time to be with us today. And we just believe that God wants to help you. So um, if there is a podcast that you want to hear us discuss, a topic you want to hear us discuss, just send us a text, 910. Text the word THINK to 910-600-0498. Until next time, you have been watching, listening this time to the Biblos Network.